Thanks so much for having me. So as uh, it was just mentioned, I'm talking about generative AI, which is all the rage, um, but how it can actually be useful, uh, not just something that high schoolers use to cheat on their essays. Um, so just to talk about an agenda, um, I'll continue with a little bit more of an introduction to myself and how SEEK came to be, kind of the origin story. Um, talk a little bit about what is a natural language interface for data? What is it? And why is it important? And also, how did it come to be? What is the history leading up to natural language interface for data? Um, I'll talk a little bit about how businesses can actually use natural language interfaces for data, uh, some of the challenges associated with not just building natural language interfaces, but also uh, using them, and just kind of wrap things up with uh, where I think things are at right now. Um, maybe I'll just come over here. So uh, a little bit about Seek. Um, so I am our original founder and our CEO. Um, I started Seek about a year and a half ago. Uh, you know, as, as you heard, before that I was a data scientist for many years, and before that an astrophysicist. Um, was at Citadel uh, most recently, um, before starting Seek, leading a data team. Um, and uh, as you can see, you know, we have a lot of other data nerds uh, leading our team. Um, so what kind of led me to start Seek? Um, I actually kept experiencing this pain point pretty much everywhere I worked. Uh, it all started, you know, my first two weeks on the job as a quant. Um, this is my very first job ever, just fresh out of grad school. And I was supposed to be working on training algorithms, but you know, I was just sitting at my desks, literally week two, and a salesperson comes up to me and is like, hey, Sarah, this client needs these stats on these algorithms. You know, can you just get this for me? And I was like, what are you asking me to do? Like, you want me to like, go into SQL and do a bunch of addition and subtraction to get these stats for you? Like, you, can't, you don't have the tools to get this yourself? And it's like, yeah, that was the case. <laughs> so it's just not what I was expecting, um, that I would have to just calculate all this stuff for non-technical people. And what was crazy was, you know, 10 years later, I realized this wasn't just a fluke. Like, I had to do this every single place I worked. But there was just no alternative. Uh, you know, there are no tools that could do this for me, so just had to do it myself. Um, and so I kind of just came to accept it as the status quo. Um, but everything changed when I saw GPT-3. <laughs> this was three years ago, believe it or not, um, almost. And you know, just seeing it generate code, it made me realize, wow, you know, this is going to change a lot about how people work with data. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about all of this as I go through the talk. Um, but just to kind of get to the next slide, a little bit more about Seek. Like I mentioned, we're a year and a half old. Um, we are based in New York, although we have employees in Cupertino, uh, Portland, Baltimore. Um, we've raised seven and a half million from Battery Ventures and Conviction, the new fund from Sarah Gua of Greylock. We are actually their first investment. Um, we have customers ranging from startups all the way to the Fortune 100. And we actually have a pretty serious AI team uh, from all these top institutions. So <laughs> ChatGPT, uh, can I just get a show of hands? Who of you have heard of ChatGPT in this conference? <laughs> How many people have actually used ChatGPT? I mean, almost everybody. So why? Why is, why is it so, so hyped? Like, what's, what's the big deal about it? Is it just hype? Is it just a bubble? What is it? Um, what really struck me the most was kind of some of these examples. It can pass the bar exam. It can pass the sommelier <laughs> exam. I don't know which is more impressive. <laughs> it can crush all the AP tests, except for English, which it's still getting, I guess, a four, or whatever it is. Um, it can build a website. So, you know, these are very impressive uh, stats to me. And the reason for the hype is because it's good. <laughs> so, to talk a little bit about why is it good, 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about my first exposure to natural language processing, which was 2019. I was a data scientist. Um, someone put me on a problem where I had to learn NLP, and I actually didn't know anything about NLP. So I took this class, uh, Stanford CS224N, just looked at the free content. And what I remember seeing in 2019 was this slide. And it really struck me. Like I circled the part at the bottom that really struck me the most. If you fully solved co-reference, arguably you've solved AI. Like what does that mean? Um, what they're saying in these slides in this class at Stanford was if you can solve this problem called co-reference resolution, which basically means in a sentence mapping all of the right expressions to the same entity as shown, they're saying you've solved AI. And I just saw that and I was like, wow, that is a bold statement to make. Like, I better listen to that. Um, so I'm not saying this is my opinion. I'm just saying this is what I saw in this class at Stanford in 2019. <laughs> so going back to this example, to do all this stuff, you, I mean, co-reference resolution is table stakes. Like, you know, mapping the same expressions in a sentence to the same entity, like, it's doing that and much more, like it's passing the bar exam. So um, in my opinion, the hype is very much warranted for this reason. So I want to talk a little bit about what existed before uh, ChatGPT and what even existed before deep learning. Um, you know, the answer is statistics and rules-based approaches. Um, so. Google Translate is a really interesting thing to talk about, how they transitioned from uh, statistical methods to deep learning. Um, so what exactly is statistical machine translation? Um, you know, this is a technique that existed before deep learning. It involves a lot of human labor, uh, modeling, um, all of these different uh, parts and permuta permutations of sentences, um, mapping different terms together and using statistics um, to model how it can map to another language. So it's very labor intensive. It involves a lot of just modeling by hand, and it involves a lot of people. So in 2016, Google switched to neural machine translation, which is deep learning based. And this was a really interesting move because with deep learning, what they realized is that it can learn a lot of these rules and statistical relationships and all this modeling. It can just learn it on its own and encode it into its parameters. So that is a really big shift. It means that something now exists that's a model that is so seamless that it doesn't require a bunch of statisticians to do all of this modeling. It can just do a lot of this on its own um, without so much human labor. And so, this is why deep learning was really important for Google Translate. So where does data come in? And where does the natural language interface for data come in? Well, the reason I talked about Google Translate is because uh, there's analogies in the world of data and the natural language interface for data. So I'm going to talk about what exactly is a natural language interface for data. Um, this is a picture from SQL Server 1996. So this was 20 years before Google switched to deep learning for Google Translate. Um, and this idea of a natural language interface has existed for much longer than, you know, way before 1996. Like this idea has been around in the 80s, if not before the 80s. Um, so what is it? Um, you know, someone asked a question into their 1996 machine, cathode ray tube monitor and all. How many of product X were sold in Washington in the last year? So you're asking a question that presumably you need some structured data to answer. A natural language application comes in and does some calculations. Some SQL here gets generated, some sort of code. Um, doesn't have to be SQL, could be other languages. It's querying a database, in this case, SQL Server, and getting the answer back to the person that asked the question. 
So you're talking to your data with natural language. Um, and this has actually existed. You know, like this, this picture is from something that I believe is called English Query. That's actually SQL Server has had since 1996 and maybe even before. Um, but, you know, as I showed with Google Translate, you know, the issue is just the stuff just didn't work, right? <laughs> like, SQL is hard. SQL generation is really, really hard. <laughs> um, and so, you know, with traditional statistical methods, um, it's kind of questionable how useful is this going to be? Um, you know, and the answer is this, this has been the dream for a really long time, but the methodologies really didn't work that well. And I'll show that with this uh, chart. So in 2021, um, you know, two years after kind of being exposed to NLP for the first time, um, I saw um, this happening. So what, what's going on in this chart? In 2020, the state of the art machine learning model couldn't solve a single question from uh, this data set called the human eval data set, which is a data set that measures uh, coding ability. So uh, th this, is, this goes back to the previous slide. Like people have dreamed of things like a natural language interface for a long time, but um, the technology just wasn't there. And so that is evident here, even in 2020, the state of the art deep learning model couldn't even answer a single question. <coughs> But as you can see, throughout 2021, these models kept getting better and better, and it just exploded. Um, like looking at 2021, the state-of-the-art model could get 72.3% of these questions correct. Um, and so this chart really just shows back in 2021, August, um, that's when we were really seeing an inflection point in the ability of deep learning models to generate code. And a big Reason for that, going back to ChatGPT, is large language models. Um, the same models that power ChatGPT. You know, I'm sure everyone here already knows this, but ChatGPT can also write code. Um, and it's actually the best uh, model out there at code generation. So this is from 2021, but the models have only gotten better. OK, so enough talking about the technology and how it's evolved. Um, I want to talk a little bit now about the business side of why are natural language interfaces needed um, and what problems are they solving. So um, I already told you a little bit about why I started Seek, um, but I want to go a little bit more into the actual problem. So uh, you know, questions are getting asked to the data team all the time. Hey, data team, sorry to bug you. But can you just pull these stats on these customers I cover? You know, I want to make sure that I prevent them from churning or whatever it is. And that's when you uh, go through this manual, manual work of going into your Snowflake or other cloud data warehouse. Um, you type out some SQL. Maybe you try to look across all the SQL you've written in the past and find uh, some code that may be similar to what you wrote. Um, and you, know, and you generate all this code on your own. Um, you might open up some sort of ticket. Uh, maybe you work with JIRA, and you know, a lot of questions come in, and you maintain them all with these JIRA tickets. Um, and finally, you put it into Matplotlib or whatever visualization tool you're using, chart it out. And then um, by the time you've actually gotten around to all of this, this is probably not the only question you're getting. You know, you're probably getting these questions from a lot of people in, in the business. And so if these questions have piled up, um, you know, one month later, maybe you finally got around to this ticket. And uh, you get back to the customer success person or whoever it was that asked you the question. And they say, thanks, but I just made the decision without the data. Sorry. <laughs> um, or worse, most of the customers just churned. <laughs> So Seek's solution is a natural language interface that business users can ask questions to and be able to get the data that they need much faster and be able to ask more questions. Um, so this is an example of a customer success manager um, asking Seek a question 
and just typing in the question that they want to have answered. Um, and behind the scenes, the way that seek works is we are doing code generation to query the data. And so this is where generative AI comes in. Um, like I mentioned before, it's not a magic bullet. Um, it's still not feasible to build a thin wrapper around GPT-4 and have a magical natural language interface for data. You know, it's still a hard problem. Um, but it's a hard problem that we are solving with generative AI as a piece of it, in addition to other things like other models and um, a great user interface. Um, just to talk a little bit more about the problems that we're solving and you know, the value that a natural language interface can add, um, something that we've seen is that sometimes there's actual revenue that can be blocked because you just don't have the data or the data analyst power that you need to be able to answer all your questions. So um, in this example, uh, something that we learn is actually within CPG uh, companies, you know, very large ones, um, there's a lot of products that they actually can't ship online because each of these products has regulations and being able to get the data for those regulations so that they can make the decision to ship these products, there's just not enough data analysts to analyze all these products and deem that they're able to be shipped. So as a result, a lot of products actually just sit around in warehouses or brick and mortar stores that could be shipped and could be generating revenue. And we actually learned that this is hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of GMV that just could be unlocked if you had the data team, you know, a bigger data team, like much bigger <laughs> working on it. Um, and so this is an example of how a natural language interface that you can just ask these questions and get the data for more products. This is an example of an increase in ROI that a company would be able to get. So um, just to talk a little bit more about uh, other benefits, you know, you can get questions answered much faster than would be possible without AI. Um, you can ask more questions. So our customers have already asked thousands of questions. Um, and you don't have to wait two weeks anymore to get an answer to a basic question that could help you tomorrow. Um, you can get answers much faster. So these are some of the benefits that businesses will achieve with a natural language interface for data. OK, so I know everyone is you know, data people, so I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of cynics in here. So this is for you guys. Um, <laughs> what are the limitations of a natural language interface? Um, I think it's helpful to talk about what's realistic today with a natural language interface. Um, you know, right now, we're really at data Q&A, which is, like I illustrated, it is already adding a lot of value. But there's a lot more that can be done in the future, too. So I want to talk a little bit about where this is all going. Um, right now, um, we're at a stage where you can ask questions. For example, how many transactions did we have in Montreal? And be able to get the data that you need back fast. But in the future, we'll be able to help with higher and higher level business questions. For example, not just how many transactions did we have in Montreal, but should we build a brick and mortar store in Montreal? And imagine asking that and getting real data back that is correct, um, in addition to pros and cons supported by the data. That's a higher level task that is still data driven, but also has a more uh, concrete point of view. Um, Moving on, um, imagine if you could just ask, should we build a brick and mortar store? And instead of just getting the pros and cons, you actually get an answer, yes or no, uh, with the pros and cons. So this is an example of kind of going from <coughs> answers to more you know, what you could call wisdom. Um, and this is where we see natural language interfaces for data continuing to add value um, in the future. OK, so this is a really gnarly challenge here. Um, you know, 
going back to the SQL Server example, if you're generating SQL to answer questions about data, this is one of the biggest challenges. Um, SQL queries, realistically, are not clean. Like, if you look at this example, um, you know, it's like four lines of SQL. Um, that's, that's not real life. Um, <laughs> like, this is real life. Um, I personally have worked at companies where there were literally 3,000 line SQL queries. Um, and so how do you even generate that much SQL? And, you know, it's just, this is a really big challenge that if you're just, again, you know, building a thin wrapper around GPT-4, um, it's not going to generate 3,000 lines of correct SQL. Um, there's a lot more work and engineering involved to actually get this to work. So it's a hard problem that um, actually hasn't been 100% um, automated yet in a way that can perform at this level of quality. Another example is how do you know you can trust the output? I think this is the real elephant in the room. Um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about this example. So uh, this is an older model of GPT. I actually asked it to GPT-4 today. And it, it, you know, it gave a much better answer, actually. Um, so this is more of an example. Um, the models have actually gotten better. <laughs> but um, somebody asked, you know, when did France gift Lithuania the Vilnius TV tower? And it just answered, France gifted Lithuania the Vilnius TV tower in 1980. And that's just not right. Um, it was actually sponsored by the Soviet Union and built in Lithuania. <laughs> So I don't know if it got it mixed up with like the Statue of Liberty or what, but it's not right. <laughs> um, so this is an example of you know what people call hallucinations of the models. Um, you can't just throw a generative AI model at a problem and let it just rip. Like you need some guardrails in place to ensure that it works. And in our world, the data world, it's completely unacceptable. <laughs> to um, ever deliver bad data to the decision makers. So the bar is really, really high. Um, and that's why that, this makes a natural language interface for data a very valuable problem, but also a very hard problem. So talking a little bit about where the space is going, um, this is the way that we see people working with data in the future. Um, this is a picture of Iron Man working with Jarvis. Um, hopefully, it'll look this cool someday. Um, but you know, the workflow, like imagine just querying data with your voice. Um, like, hey, Seek, pull up this data. And you can tell it whatever transformations you need, and then just add some more data on top. Um, this is really where we see the workflow going in the future, is being able to just query data very easily without needing to know anything about the data and certainly not having to bother the data team. So the data team can be working on tasks that also add value to the business that only they can work on, like cleaning the data and discovering. In my case, I come from the hedge fund world and trading world. So in my case, it would have been I would have loved to have more time to just mine through the data and discover insights that could make our company money, you know, what we call alpha. That's, a, that's an example that's personal to me. And every business has that example of those hard problems that only the data team can solve, that they just can't get to right now. So in conclusion, um, a couple things. The first thing is the quality of natural language interfaces is higher than ever before. And a lot of this goes, uh, a lot of the credit goes towards deep learning. And in particular, this much hyped generative AI. Like, it's not just hype, you know, it actually is adding real value to businesses to get more insights from their data today. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, there are a lot of challenges involved working with generative AI, especially for data, and working with natural language interfaces for data. And so those of you that are considering working with this kind of technology, um, I hope that it was helpful that I laid out some of the challenges that you should consider, um, especially as you think about 
your stack and how these kinds of platforms fit in. Um, and for those of you who you know, are thinking of building with te this technology, I hope that it, it helped you um, kind of understand the challenges as well. But in conclusion, those of you who do decide to adopt natural language interfaces for data to your tech stack will result in a business that enjoys more accessibility to data than ever before. Thank you.